milking, milking, milking. I thought it would help you to see how I make the sound with my mouth and my, my lips to be able to properly say milking, because that's an important skill. Uh, this is part B, capillary exchange is the next topic. How do we move things in and out of capillaries? So we need to take oxygen, move it into the capillaries at the lungs, move it out of the capillaries at the tissues, move the CO2 into the capillaries at the tissues, move it out of the capillaries at the lungs, this whole crazy process. Let's show you how we do it. It works through uh, gradients, pressure gradients, uh, and it forces diffusion across. So uh, for the most part, we have direct diffusion across the plasma membrane. Uh, and it'll be tied to these fenestrations here at the bottom. Fenestrations are pores, these small uh, micro pores in the plasma membrane um, that enable these gases to pass through. Uh, occasionally also through endocytosis or exocytosis, but this is uh, far more minor compared to the fenestrations or the gaps uh, that the capillaries have because they don't, they're not held tightly by tight junctions. There's some space. Um, so there's space between the cells and then also within the membranes themselves, these fenestrations or these pores. Um, and this is all driven by pressure gradients or pressure differences. So here this is showing you these pores, what we're talking about um, to be able to move things in and out. Uh, this is the direct diffusion, which is what we're focusing on or showing you here. Um, here you have a capillary. Okay, on this side, the, the arteries are feeding the capillary. And on this side, the, uh, the capillary is feeding the veins and the, the blood flow is moving out that way. Now, one thing you're going to notice is that at the arterial side, the, the pressure at that capillary inside the capillary is higher than the pressure just outside the capillary in the interstitial uh, fluid. And as a result, there's a natural force or pressure causing the diffusion from the inside to the out. So oxygen is moving to the outside on the arterial side of the capillaries. Towards the venous side now, there's fewer things inside the capillary, so the pressure has gone down. But the pressure on the outside is higher on the venous side because we have a very large accumulation of CO2 and that higher pressure is going to force the CO2 into the capillary because there's higher pressure in the interstitial fluid outside compared to the pressure inside. And there, there you see the net pressure in uh, moving things in from the tissues. Um, so that's how diffusion works in the capillary beds. Um, now what happens when things get messed up as they always do? I shouldn't say always do, sometimes do. Well, one of them being congestive heart failure. Uh, this is a progressive uh, deteriorating condition uh, masked by or uh, incorporating coronary atherosclerosis, which we'll talk about in a second, the, uh, the buildup of fatty plaques in the uh, vessel walls, uh, very high blood pressure, consistent hypertension, uh, and then potentially multiple myocardial infarcts or multiple heart attacks. When you're in congestive heart failure, you're basically stuck in the hospital on bed rest and you're waiting for a heart transplant. If you don't get a heart transplant, you will, you will die. Varicose veins we've talked about before, when blood pools in the legs, it's difficult to move it up through the veins back to the heart, of course. And so blood pools. The more you're on your feet, especially in a career, the more likely you are to get varicose veins. This is typical of waiters and waitresses and politicians and teachers and things, people that are on their feet all the time. So the blood uh, tends to pool in their legs. Very easy to take care of, but um, in any case, that's varicose veins. Hypertension, I mentioned, high blood pressure. Hypotension is low blood pressure. Um, atherosclerosis that I previously touched on are these small fatty deposits uh, in the actual vessel wall. So inside the tunica uh, media, which is largely muscle, we have a buildup of fatty plaques. Um, it's partially due to genetics. It's partially due to diet. So if you eat tons of saturated fat and cholesterol and so on, it can boost that, those levels. And they build up, build up, build up until one day the, uh, there's so much fatty plaque inside the vessel wall that it ruptures and you get this bulge that shoots into the, uh, into the artery or the vein, um, most dangerously in the artery. That causes a block up. You get platelets sticking to it, causing a clot. Uh, very sudden, very uh, immediate. Uh, most problematic in the uh, coronary arteries as well as in the arteries or the, the capillaries of the brain. And as a result, uh, you can get a heart attack or a stroke. Uh, arteriosclerosis is the end of atherosclerosis which the plaques harden, you get increased rigidity of the vessels on top of the potential breakout of that uh, plaque into the uh, ongoing flow. Uh, the vessels themselves start to stiffen and they can't adjust and vasoconstrict and dilate in response to, to increasing or decreasing pressure. So as a result, the pressure steadily climbs inside the blood vessel and inside the, uh, the cardiovascular system, 
causing wear and tear on the heart, and that's more difficult for the heart to pump. The heart has to work harder. And then coronary artery disease, as we mentioned, tied to atherosclerosis, filling up the blood vessels with these fatty calcified deposits that can rupture and break out um, and can slowly but surely also build up not just inside the tunica media, but also just in the vascular, uh, in the vessel itself, in the lumen, and shrink, 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 shrink the space that blood has to, has to flow through. And as a result, eventually it'll get fully clogged um, and you have to clean it out, uh, basically. There's different ways of cleaning it out with the stent is a fairly common thing where it's a little metal cage. Uh, they stick into the blood vessel and then they open up the cage with a balloon on the inside and they push all the fatty deposit up against the sides and then they leave the stent, this little metal ring cage inside the blood vessel uh, to hold all the fatty deposit out. Uh, and it works a fair amount of the time. How did your heart de uh, develop? Well, it began with a little tube heart, uh, basically a single tube, almost like the heart of an earthworm. If you didn't know, an earthworm has uh, five hearts. Each one is basically an aorta, a single tube. So it's like a tube heart that develops in the human. Uh, when you were a embryo, you were like a earthworm. Mm, awkward. And at the fourth week, you have a four-chambered heart. Uh, it's fully developed, two atria, two ventricles. And then by about seven weeks, um, sorry, four, at the at fourth week, this heart starts to pump, the tube heart. And at seven weeks, you have a four-chambered heart that's actually visible on ultrasound. Um, so at eight weeks, for example, uh, we saw my son's heart beating, which is pretty cool to see for the first time. Um, it's working just like it uh, should when it's larger. And then uh, from that moment on, everything just kind of gets bigger, but structurally all, everything's organized and in place. Um, and on that note, we are done with cardiovascular milking.